After centuries of white domination and decades of apartheid, the political leaders of white and black South Africans agreed to negotiate a political settlement after the unbanning of the liberation movements and the freeing of political prisoners in 1990. By early 1994, after four years of talks and negotiations, the different parties agreed to an interim constitution and an election, which was held on 27 April 1994. Nelson Mandela was sworn in as the country's first democratic president. But how was South Africa going to deal with its violent and oppressive past? Simply burying it and trying to forget it, while allowing all those who had committed gross human rights violations in the name of politics to get away with it, were not seen as options. Accountability was a prerequisite for human rights culture in the new democracy. Some argued strongly for criminal trials for former soldiers, policemen and their commanders and political bosses, referring to the trials of Nazi war criminals after World War II as example. But it was important to take the white minority along into the New Deal, and even more important for the apartheid security forces to accept a change of political power to the majority. Parliament then came up with a compromise which would reveal and acknowledge the past but would also promote reconciliation and offer amnesty to perpetrators in return for the truth. The Promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act of 1995 created the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that had to facilitate this process. Nobel Peace Prize winner Anglican Archbishop Desmond Tutu was appointed chairperson of the Truth Commission. President Mandela then selected the 17 Truth Commissioners from a short list of 25 names that had been chosen by a multi-party panel. The South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which had its first hearing in East London on 16 April 1996, was not the first Truth Commission in the world. If you look at some of the more prominent examples of these kinds of Truth Commissions in Latin America, for example, you have both examples where commissions were set up through presidential decree in Chile and Argentina, both. And one thing about that model is that because they were set up through a presidential decree and not through national legislation, they weren't able to take on certain powers, such as the power to subpoena, which has become so important to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission here. But they only had powers to invite people, either perpetrators or victims or families of the disappeared, to come forward and give testimony. Unfortunately, in both Chile and Argentina, they primarily took evidence from families of the victims and not from perpetrators. They had almost no collaboration from perpetrators, which is strikingly different from South Africa. This is really the only case because of the amnesty model that has been set up here, where in exchange for the truth, amnesty might be granted. So because of that, there has been a reason for perpetrators to come forward and tell the exact truth about what they did. And people often say, why don't we have trials instead? And it's, it's not an either or, actually. There's examples such in as in Argentina where the Commission on the Disappeared, when it closed its doors, it handed its files directly to the prosecutor's office. And that led to the trial of the leadership of the military regime and put a few persons in jail. And that came directly from the information from the Commission, for example. Even if you look at, at South Africa, some trials certainly would have been possible. I, I think it's already been clear as to the limitations that those trials would confront and those that we have seen here. But in addition to that, there's a certain amount of truth that comes from a trial, and it certainly isn't the full truth. It can't be the broad truth. You can't cover 35 years of repression. You can't look at the systematic nature of violations behind, be it apartheid, for example. Our Truth Commission here is very different because we have television cameras recording every single, single moment and radio microphones um, and it's broadcast on a daily basis. Does that, to your, in your experience, make a big difference? It's, it's absolutely remarkable to me to watch the process here. I mean, it's, it's so much so that I would say most other commissions are a commission about a product, and the commission in South Africa is a commission about a process, and it's the process that will affect the country that is affecting the country. 
the Truth Commission was also tasked with painting a picture of the past so that the causes, nature and extent of political violence could be better understood. The Commission therefore held special hearings and invited role players on all sides of the conflict to make submissions. Special hearings were held on prisons, women, children, the State Security Council, the military and police, the different political parties, the media, the medical profession, the religious communities and even the behaviour of Winnie Mandela's Mandela United Football Club in Soweto in the late 1980s. The Commission had three committees overseeing its three functions a Human Rights Violations Committee, an Amnesty Committee, and a Reparation and Rehabilitation Committee. The Human Rights Violations Committee investigated the human rights abuses that occurred in South Africa between 1961 and 1994. Agents of the Commission went into the communities to gather statements from people who were victims or survivors of politically motivated violence. More than 21,000 such statements were gathered. Of these, about 2,000 were invited to tell their stories at public hearings of the Commission. These hearings took place all over South Africa between 1996 and 1998. It all began here on 15 April 1996 in the Eastern Cape, the womb of apartheid resistance over decades. Here, in the glare of the world's media, they stepped where no one had gone before, and they spoke the first words in the great telling of our shameful and proud past. There were the wounded and the pained, And I was still 20 at the time, and I couldn't handle this. So I was taken to Nyami's place. And when I got there, Nyami was crying terribly. And then there were those with great loss in their hearts and anger in their veins. I don't want to cry. Really, I don't want to cry, but I would like the commission to help me. They were the brave pioneers of the Truth Commission, those who led all the others to sow their truths into the patchwork quilt of a new history. There's been a lot of evil. I mean, there's been a lot of evil in this country. Um, it's, it's being exorcised. The Commission sat in noisy cities and quiet dorpies. They sat in big, imposing town halls and dingy schools and churches, from Messina in the north to Cape Town in the south. And from everywhere the victims came. Some were dignified, silver-haired elders, others impassioned young lions. Sometimes they were even small, little lions. The stories were of torture and abduction, Rumours that became reality. This is Piwa's hair. This is the scalp. They spoke about massacres and wars. They spoke about the death of a single child and about the killing of whole families. I heard their voices. No one screamed twice. Each one screamed just once. Then I'd hear the next one, and another one, until they finished them all. There were those who wept about loved ones who disappeared without a trace. But the common thread was that everywhere, the extent of the horror was more than anyone had ever suspected. Even the smallest village had its casualties. The process was not easy. 
often the truth was frightening. As the process gained momentum, victims sometimes came face to face with perpetrators and the grim reality of what they did. Few remained untouched as the floodgates of emotion were wedged open. It is 25 years now and that I will not forget what happened. I ask the Almighty that I will not forget what happened and that I need to know. I remember pain of a scale that I didn't think a human being could ever um, experience. So I would just crawl into the toilet and drink from the toilet sink. There were the cynics, of course. Some called it the crying commission. But often they were white or old allies of apartheid and scared of the guilt that came with hearing the truth. But then there were those who became part of the telling and through that, some sort of reconciliation. I had in my heart of verwonde, soms verplinter me, sir. My and my kinders verhaal is klein. In vergelijking met so veel ander vir wie ons harte bloei. Ons zwaar krij is maar een druppel in die Zuid-Afrikaanse emmer. But what did all these who came to bear their souls seek? For many it was simply enough to tell their story to a nation whose time it was to listen. Others wanted to lay the past to rest. Again and again they asked for the remains of those who had disappeared. For some, like the family of murdered ANC Kada Pilan Dwandwe, this became a terrible reality. For others, the bones were lost forever, dumped into this river. But knowing this was the beginning of the ending for them. Over the 14 months, the South African truth process developed its own unique identity. Even while listening to the most harrowing testimony, people could still laugh. People also sang, gave comfort to others, and when there was nothing more to say, they prayed. The Amnesty Committee consisted of legal people and each sitting was presided over by a judge. Unlike the hearings on human rights violations, all participants had the right to be represented by lawyers who could test evidence through the cross-examination of witnesses. The Act stipulated three preconditions for amnesty. Applicants had to speak the truth and reveal all relevant information. They had to prove that their crime was politically motivated or ordered by a political organization. And it had to be proportional to the crime. I had gone there to shoot any living thing. It was my aim to shoot anybody within the tavern. He just grabbed an iron pipe and beat the poor old man several times in his head. And as he did so, all the people we joined in. Captain von Seil had for Mnea Hase with a pin 2-2 gewehr geskiet. He had the gewehr on my oor handig, where I on my beard for Mnea Godelosi geskiet had. And Mnea Lotz had for Mnea Galela geskiet, and we had him, as it all three the overledeners, on the hout stapel geplaas. After 1,888 days of hearings, 1,167 applicants were granted amnesty 
out of 7,116 applications. The amnesty process was opposed by some political lobbies and families of survivors who insisted that it undermined justice. I would want to stress still the fact that it was justice, not retributive justice, but restorative justice. We were looking more to heal than to punish the, the perpetrator. We were looking for a, a way of dealing with, with the, the offenses and the violations in such a way that we were not more disruptive, that we, we, were, we, were, we were actually using the principles of Ubuntu, uh, which speaks about how our humanity is one that is caught up in one another's. You know, for instance, that it was through the amnesty process that we were able to, you spoke about truth, we got the truth about people who had been abducted, killed, and buried secretly. We would not have easily come by that truth. It enabled us to exhume the remains of many people who had disappeared um, uh, mysteriously and that enabled the, their loved ones to experience the so-called closure. A central principle guiding the Truth Commission was that all sides of the conflict would be treated fairly and all violations of human rights be treated the same way even if committed by former freedom fighters. The legitimacy of the armed struggle against apartheid was accepted by the Truth Commission, but the point was also made that unjust things could happen in a just war. In war, soldiers may kill. Soldiers may kill enemy soldiers. They may intentionally, deliberately kill in combat enemy soldiers without that being war, uh, being murder. Combatants may legitimately kill other combatants. But the bu fundamental principle of justice in war is the distinction between combatants and non-combatants. You may never, even in a just war, 